Good morning. Glad to see you here at St. Paul's. This is a Reformation weekend. We celebrate the Lutheran Reformation, the, the work of God as he takes that promise in Jesus Christ that is lost and found again and how he restored it to his church so that we today can hear that beautiful message in the word and receive the comfort of the forgiveness of sins and know that we have a home in heaven. Today we celebrate that beautiful message and thank God that he has given it to us and that we are able now to pass it on to others. May God bless our worship today as we hear that word and take it to heart. We'll follow the service that is laid out for us. It is a little bit different for our celebration today, but just follow along in the bulletin or on the screen. Let's begin with our first hymn. We sing, O God, our Lord, your holy word. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed are they whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done. And we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us. Forgive us and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus.
God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all our sins. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, our refuge and strength, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in all temptations. Defend them against all their enemies. And bestow on the church your saving peace through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading is recorded for us in the book of Jeremiah, the prophet, chapter 31, and this also serves as the basis for the sermon today. God gives a new covenant in our Savior, Jesus Christ, one in which He promises his faithful love, his forgiveness, now and forever. We read, Yes, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant of mine, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will each one teach his neighbor or each one teach his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their guilt and I will remember their sins no more. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our worship continues with the God is our refuge and strength. We'll follow the printed directions. The choir will sing the antiphon once, and then the choir will join in singing it after that.
Our second reading is from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5. The Apostle Paul writes these words to a group of Christians, a congregation in turmoil, because they have fallen into a way that is going to take them apart from God, away from God, because they are trusting in themselves and in their keeping of the law, rather than trusting simply and solely in what Jesus Christ has done. He writes Galatians chapter 5, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not allow anyone to put the yoke of slavery on you again. Look, I, Paul, tell you that if you allow yourselves to be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. I testify again to every man who allows himself to be circumcised that he is obligated to do the whole law. You who are trying to be declared righteous by the law are completely separated from Christ. You have fallen from grace. Indeed, through the Spirit we by faith are eagerly waiting for the sure hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision matters. Rather, it is faith working through love that matters. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. We join in the gospel acclamation. gospel recorded for us in John chapter 8. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you remain in my word, you are really my disciples. You will also know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We are Abraham's descendants, they answered, and we have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say we will be set free? Jesus answered, amen, amen, I tell you. Everyone who keeps committing sin is a slave to sin, but a slave does not remain in the family forever. A son does remain forever. So if the son sets you free, you really will be free. The gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Let's sing our hymn of the day, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
God's gifts of grace and mercy and peace are yours now and always, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. We've heard the words of our text today from Jeremiah 31, so let's pray. O Lord, sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, so when was the last time you broke something? Maybe not too long ago. In fact, you could probably easily remember a time when you broke something or something broke that was unexpected. Maybe it was a little bit new. And what did you think? Oh, the craftsmanship these days, the effort put into these things, they just don't make them like they used to, right? Right? Maybe you turned it over or looked at the bottom or looked at the packaging it came in and said, where did this thing come from? Oh, it came from there. Well, of course, it wasn't made very well. Of course, it broke. You've probably heard that the church is broke. It's broken. There are Many people who have taken a look at numbers, statistics, done polls, and they've come to the conclusion that God's church is broken. And I understand the temptation to think for a moment that "Hmm, must be not very good craftsmanship, workmanship. It's not like it used to be. Maybe we try and look at the backside of the church, we turn it over and say, hmm, I wonder where this thing was made. And then we go, oh, maybe that's why it's so broken. Why is the church broken? Whether you want to take a look at declining numbers or just the amount of ways that people serve or don't serve in the church, the amount of offerings, it does seem to me that the Christian church on an overall thing is on a downward trend. Other religions are on the rise. What's happening to the church? You know, this brokenness, if you will, of the church is not something new. In fact, if you just think for a brief moment about the history of God's people, it seems like the church keeps breaking again and again and again. Just think back to the very beginning. God made his church in the Garden of Eden, man and woman, perfect in God's image. There they were until it got ruined and they became sinful and tried to hide from God, right? Things didn't get much better in the near future after that. In in fact, when God looked at the world right before the flood, he looked at humanity and how terrible they had become and they said, Every thought of humanity's heart is only evil all the time. And so God tried to reset things with Noah and his family, wiping everybody else out. But how long did it take after the flood for them, humanity, the church of God and Noah and his family, and then their descendants to start going off the rails again, to break, as they built the Tower of Babel, which was not part of God's plan for them. That was against God's word until God had to reset them and send them scattering across the face of the earth. And time and again after that, God used His people to proclaim that message. But every time that message went out, it seemed like where it had success, it didn't take long for it to finally break again. Think of what happened with Joseph and his brothers. Think of what happened in God's people in Egypt. Think of when God led them out of the land of Egypt. And you might think that there in the wilderness, at the foot of the mountain of God, things would be set right once again. But it didn't take long for Aaron to build the golden calf and God's people to fall down and worship an idol. And you know what? That idol worship clung to God's people and they fell to that terrible curse again and again throughout their history, even when King David came to the throne, 
You would think that now they have God's man on the throne. Now they're going to set things right and things are just going to take off. and It'll be perfect from then on. But of course, you know, David was not a perfect man. And it didn't take long for him and his mistakes to become a burden for the people. Time and again, God tried to reset them, sending them off into captivity, giving them leaders that would lead them for a while. But in the end, they kept breaking. Even when it came time for Jesus to walk among his people, his church, we can see just how broken they were. As time and again, he has to talk to the Pharisees and point out to them that they are trusting not in God, but in their own self-righteousness. When they should have been listening to the words of Jesus and being his disciples, they wanted to do their own thing. Things didn't get much better after Jesus ascended into heaven. Even though Christianity spread out across the world after that with those disciples and the early Christian church, it even became the dominant church of the entire continent of Europe, right? But of course, you know that the problems still popped up in that church too. As people were taught and believed that they needed to do something to be right with God on their own. Until Luther stood up and said, no, that is not how it works. Look at what the Scriptures say. Today, here we are. Inheritors of a long line of the believing in the Word of God and trusting in that promise. And people still have to look at the church and say, it looks like it's broken. In that, in that history that we just went through, if we come to the conclusion that the church is broken and broken again and again and again, why is it broken? Is it the craftsmanship? Is it where the church has come from? Our text actually has the answer for us today. As the Lord speaks through Jeremiah, and talks about the old covenant that he had with the people and what happened to that covenant, what happened to that church so long ago. He writes about this covenant, that a new covenant he's going to make, not like the old one. He says, It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant of mine, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Why is the church broken? This isn't the moment to point fingers at God, is it? The reality is, is that if the church is broken, and I think we see its weaknesses, its problems, its faults, we have to admit that we're the problem. God's people whether you want to look back in time and say it's Adam and Eve or the descendants of Noah or Moses and Aaron or David or whoever you want to point at, yeah, if there's brokenness in God's church, we're the cause of it. How good is our listening to the Word of God and remaining in that Word of God? I'd have to say that we're broken. How good, at we are, how good are we at giving God our best in everything, whether it be financial or our time or our effort? It's broken, isn't it? How good are we at reaching out to those who don't know Jesus, carrying that great commission out just as Jesus commanded us to take his good news to the whole world? broken, isn't it? God, by His grace and mercy, knows how to fix the church. He knows that the church is not something that He should look at, turn over and investigate and say, oh, well, that's why, and then take it and pitch it into the nearest dumpster like we do with the things that break at our homes and businesses. 
Instead, he takes a look at his church. He takes a look at his people of every age, and he says, you know, I've got the exact thing to fix it. And even though it breaks again, and again, and again, I am going to keep working on it and fixing it and making it function by my grace. This is what the Lord is talking about when he, write, when he says through Jeremiah, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, with his people like you and me. And how different is it going to be? How is he going to make the church unbroken? How is he going to fix it? He says, I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will each one teach his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their guilt and I will remember their sins no more. It is those last two lines there, God fixes his church again and again and again. For he declares to you, to me, to all Christians, again and again through that word of God, Jesus Christ has come and he has taken away all sin by his death on the cross. You know what happened on that cross, how Jesus himself was broken. Not by his own sin, but by that sin of all people, you and me included. Our sins, our brokenness, our failures on Jesus on the cross. And there he gladly and willingly let himself be broken completely in death. Yes, even suffering hell itself. So that he could declare that it is finished. Forgiveness, eternal life, and the hope of heaven are now ours forever. This limits the supply of forgiveness and peace and joy and hope in Jesus is what he uses again and again to fix and repair his church, to strengthen it where it's weak, to set it on the right path once again and move it forward step by step, day by day, year by year, yes, century by century. It may truly appear at times, and again, you can think of some times where it seems like the church doesn't have a hope. It's on that downward spiral that's only going to end in doom and disaster. But God promises to always be there for His church, to always fix it, to always be ready to give His church exactly what we need. He does this through his powerful word. Note what he says in our text. I will put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts. This will be something that is part of who we are. We may not be the best at it, and at times we're quite broken in that word of God. We don't do as we should. But by God's grace, he uses even those little crumbs, those little bits that we get, even if it is just once a week, to build us up and inspire us. So that, with his help, the day comes when we find ourselves on Monday morning opening up our Bibles, and on Tuesday and Wednesday and throughout the week, reading our meditations, faithfully spending time with God and his word so that it is in our minds and on our hearts. And having that word of God on our mind and heart, then by faith in him, we will trust his promise when he says to us, I will be their God, and they will be my people. This beautiful relationship between God and His people is going to be cemented firmly, just as He says, they will be my people. I will be their God, and He will be with us all the time, now and forever. Even when it seems that there is just suffering and pain and all we really feel or notice is brokenness inside and out, yet God is there with us.
to hold us by the hand, to speak to us through His Word and strengthen us for those hard times so that we can take comfort in the fact that even though this life is full of pain and brokenness, we will be God's people and He will be our God on into eternity forever and ever, the hope of heaven. Astounding, I think, how God takes what is so broken and makes it so functional and so useful. I wish I could do that with the things I break at the house, with the things that I find broken, church and school. Oh, I wish I could just fix things. My dad was always good at fixing things. I'm not as good as he is. There are times where I wish I could fix the church, but... Then again, I also know I'm not able to fix the church, but there is one who is, and He does. God does. He is more than capable to fix whatever is broken, whatever is needed. He even uses me, He even uses you to do the work that, God, that He has given to us so that all people will know the Lord, and knowing Him trusting in Him, to know that their sins are forgiven, to know that they have a God who is always with them, to know that they have a sure hope of eternal life. May our prayer always be that God continues to build us up and strengthen us for His work as His people, and may that forgiveness inspire us to be loving and forgiving and encouraging to one another that God's church may carry on in strength and glory for all eternity. Amen. Please stand. May that peace of God which surpasses our understanding guard and keep our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. For our confession of faith, we'll join in singing our next hymn, Christ Alone, the World's Redeemer. As we sing the hymn, you may be seated.
Our worship continues with the prayer of the church. It's uh, printed out for you. It's also be on the screen. We include today a couple of special prayers, one on behalf of Ethel Zimmerman and her family. Uh, you may know that she has been struggling with cancer, and her family is caring for her, so we're going to pray for them as they face some dark days ahead. We're also going to pray for uh, Kelly Alonzo. She hurt her knee, and she's going to have some tests this week, and we hope those give her good news. Let's pray. Gracious God, in mercy you sent your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, into this world to redeem us from sin and rescue us from hell. Through your Scriptures and by your Spirit, you have brought us to faith in your Son and have assured us that Christ has fully completed the work of our salvation. Lead us to rejoice in the message of forgiveness through faith alone in Christ Jesus. When guilt grieves our consciences and shame squelches our confidence, use your word to encourage and comfort our souls with the good news of your unconditional love. Almighty God, in the face of immense pressure to compromise their confession, you emboldened Martin Luther and the Lutheran reformers to take a stand firm on the truths of Scripture. Through their clear confession of faith, you restored the gospel to your church and have preserved this saving truth among us today. Send us your Holy Spirit that we exhibit the same zeal and faithfulness as the Lutheran confessors. Give us courage to confess our faith sincerely and boldly in the classroom, the workplace, the community, and to everyone we encounter who needs to hear the truth of your word. Use our confession to bring faith in your Son to the hearts of those who do not yet believe in you. Eternal God, you have promised to preserve and protect your church in every age. Even when it appeared that the enemies of the gospel had silenced your truth, you kept your people faithful to you and your word. Bless all who face hardships for their faith with an added measure of your Holy Spirit, so that they do not lose heart as they bear their crosses. Comfort the sick and the suffering, the depressed and lonely, those who are persecuted and ridiculed for their faith, and all others who need the encouragement of your love. Fix our eyes on the cross of your Son, his empty tomb, and the sure promise of eternal life in heaven's glory. Today we especially remember our sister in Christ, Ethel Zimmerman, and her family. We ask that you would continue to be their hope. Remind them that you hold them all in your hands, and you will be with them even in the dark days ahead. As you strengthen them in faith, use them to be your witnesses to the glorious hope of the resurrection. O oh Lord Jesus, we also put into your care Kelly Alonzo as she prepares for tests this week on her knee. We ask that you would grant her strength of faith so that even though she may have pain, she may see your love at work in her life. Encourage her that she may continue to turn to your word and the hope that you give there for her and all Christians. O oh Lord God, you know the concerns of our hearts and minds. Hear the public prayers we have spoken with our lips and the personal prayers we offer to you in our hearts, and answer them according to your gracious will. Increase our trust in your power and wisdom, that we may rest secure in the plans and purposes you have for our lives. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Our worship continues with our offering. At this time, you're asked to fill out one of the worship cards. Uh, if you do have an offering, you can do so online. There are also offering plates near the exits as you leave today. I invite you to give your attention to the bell choir as they play for us. Lord, keep us steadfast in your word.
Please stand for prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please remain standing for our closing hymn. It's just the one verse of God's word is our great heritage. Please be seated. Again, welcome. Glad you could worship with us today. Thank you to our choirs for so enriching our worship today. We appreciate it very much. A couple of things to highlight for this coming month of November. We are going to be starting November. It's just around the corner. Uh, there is uh, some extra copies of our newsletter on the Communication Center as well as meditations. The uh, poinsettias are, uh, the envelopes and box are also there at the uh, communication center as well. Coming up is our Thanksgiving meal this month of November. We are planning a meal just like we've done in the past. There'll be sign-ups, we'll be doing deliveries. Uh, we need people to help us out with all of that. So we'll be putting out a sign-up sheet for not only those who want meals, but also those who are willing to help. Uh, one of the um, first ways to help is to get the word out into our community. And so next Sunday, uh, as soon as we can get that going, I think it'll be right around uh, 11 o'clock or so, 11.15, we'll get out into the community and put door hangers around to invite people and let them know that we are having a Thanksgiving meal, and if they want to participate, they can give us a call, and we'll be glad to serve them with a meal. So watch for a bit more information on that, too. Um, also, one other thing that's going to be happening next weekend, next Sunday, uh, Early Childhood Ministry. Just to quickly, if you will, you have probably heard that we've been talking about this. In fact, we've been talking about it for a number of years. Uh, right now, our school serves three-year-olds and four-year-olds in our kindergarten. Uh, and uh, we've, for years, have been talking about when would be a good time to expand that into the ages zero to two. And it seems that God has provided opportunities for us. Doors are opening. And we want to take a look at those opportunities. And so we're inviting some consultants to come from our synod, people who are experienced in early childhood and providing care for zero to two, to give us some advice. And they're coming this week, and next weekend they're going to be giving us the results of what they have found and to direct us what direction to go, give us advice about the challenges and the opportunities. So that'll be after our worship service and a brief fellowship time next Sunday. So please, if you can come for that and hear more about what our church, our congregation may be doing in the community, uh, that would be an excellent opportunity. I know I'm looking forward to it. It's an excellent uh, opportunity to learn more about how we can continue to serve people in our community with the gospel. 
more information to the bulletin, you can catch one of the pastors after our worship too on that. Uh, we do have our fellowship all set up for our uh, after service. Uh, Sunday school will be downstairs as well, so I'll take uh, Sunday school down there right away and we'll get started. Thank you again for coming. Spend a few moments here to greet one another and spend some more time in God's house. And God strengthen you through his word. Uh, may the words we have heard today and the words we share with one another encourage us always to remain faithful and true to God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, for he has so loved us and saved us. In his name, amen.